Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk about Fannie Lou Hamer, one of my biggest heroes next to Harriet Tubman. Um, so a little bit about me. I uh, am an historian. I have my PhD in American history with a specialty in women's history and African American history from the University of New Hampshire. Uh, my dissertation back in the late 90s, early 2000s was on Harriet Tubman and it came out as a book. It was the first full-length biography of Tubman since the 1940s. And of course, it was all sorts of new research that the earlier authors had never had access to. Um, and so Tubman has been my passion for the past 25 or more years. I still research her life every single day. We have two national parks now in her honor, a state park, a 250-mile byway. Um, we have lots of things dedicated to Harriet Tubman statues. She's going to be on our $20 bill. Yeah. Oh. Yay. About time there was a woman on our money. I know. <laughs> and a real freedom fighter. Um, so back when I was in graduate school in the 1990s, um, I uh, took a core, I, in one of my courses, I learned about the civil rights movement, and I learned about Fannie Lou Hamer. And um, I had not known about her. I mean, I was a kid during the 60s. And so I didn't really know that much about the civil rights movement. So I learned about her. And she was always in the back of my mind. And as I researched and did a lot of work on Harriet Tubman, Hamer was always there. And I came to realize that they're very similar women, just 100 years apart. Both freedom fighters. Both came out of the most difficult of circumstances and struggled to bring freedom and equality and justice to the world and to make this country fulfill its promise of um, democracy and equality for all. So, you know, I've written, I, the, the Tubman book came out in 2003, 2004. Um, I did a book on Mary Surratt, who was involved in the plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Um, she was a terrible woman. She was not an American hero. Um, and she was hanged for that. And then I wrote a book about Rosemary Kennedy, the Kennedy daughter who was disa intellectually disabled and who was lobotomized. Um, I wrote her biography, which was really powerful because I, I, by putting her at the center of that Kennedy family story, which we all know, there are so many books about the Kennedys, but when you put Rosemary at the center, you see the family very, very differently. And I credit her with sort of activating her siblings to become powerful advocates for the disabled across this country. And as a result of that, we have um, so, so, during uh, President Jack Kennedy's administration, he signed legislation to establish institutes at the National Institute of Health for women and children and, and more. And then Ted Kennedy, of course, our senator, who went on to help sponsor and push through Congress lots of legislation related to um, disabilities, Americans with Disabilities Act, et cetera. So that just putting Rosemary at the center of that family story and seeing how those siblings loved her and were deeply affected by her helped me see the family and its legacy in a different light. Which brought me to Fannie Lou Hamer. After I was done with Rosemary in 2015, I was trying to come up with another uh, book idea. And, <clears throat> and I went through a few subjects. But nothing really hit me. And Fannie Lou Hamer was still there in my mind. And it was like she was getting louder. So I thought, well, I'll just look into her life and see if the prior biographies had done all the work that needed to be done and could I contribute anything. Well, I would say in about two months, I was hooked. And I thought, well, even if I just repeat everything that all the other biographers say, <coughs> it doesn't matter. I felt I had to do the biography. Um, as it turns out, I did find out a lot about her that hadn't been written about before. Um, but she just is a remarkable human being. So I'm looking forward to sharing information about her, her story with you, for those of you especially who don't know her or remember her from the civil rights movement of the 60s. <clears throat> so Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Townsend, was born in October of 1917 um, in Mississippi. 
She was the 20th child of Jim and Ella Townsend, who were sharecroppers. Um, she lived in, in desperate poverty. When she was born, the 20th child, as I said, seven of her siblings had already died. Four of them were babies in the four years before she was born. The survival rate for an African-American child in Mississippi at the time was uh, abysmal. Uh, one out of four would die by the time they reached the age of five. Lack of access to uh, health care, the ability to pay for health care, discrimination, uh, lack of nutrition because the poverty rate was so high in Mississippi. And, oh, sorry about that. And her parents, who worked really hard, and the older children worked in the fields with them. Um, in the sharecropping system, it is an unfair system. It is a brutal work task. It just replaced slavery in many ways. And the families would contract with the generally white plantation owners. They would have so many acres of land that they would uh, be responsible for. They would plant the crops, and in this case, the Townsend cotton, and um, they would borrow from the plantation owners. Um, uh, they would t t be loaned the seed, farm animals, whatever <coughs> equipment they needed, their shacks that they lived in. So at the end of the season, when the crop was sold, they would split the profits ostensibly 50-50 with the plantation owner. But the plantation owner deducted all the expenses of supplying everything to the sharecroppers and they were always at inflated prices. And some families in some years would end up indebted to the plantation owner, so it became a cycle of debt peonage, and the families couldn't leave or get out of that debt cycle, um, and it was just a, not a great situation. But she, um, she started picking cotton when she was uh, six years old, and the little bit of cotton that she could pick was uh, pennies, that would add to the coffers in her family's uh, home. Education was extremely uh, spotty in Mississippi. Uh, schools for black children only received uh, like 13 cents to every dollar that white schools got. And in the Mississippi Delta in uh, Sunflower County outside of Ruleville where Harry, I mean, um, Fannie Lou Hamer's family settled, um, the schools were only open a few months in the winter time when the fields were fallow and there wasn't anything going on. The schoolhouses were poorly built with poorly paid teachers who tried their best to teach these children with no resources, books, etc. It was cold in the winter time. Oftentimes, children were not adequately clothed. And in the winter time, it was really tough on sharecropping families because if they didn't make enough money, to buy food to survive in the winter, those kids suffered a lot. Fannie Lou Hamer talked about her mother um, trying to cook up onions with flour and grease to feed them as a meal because they had no money and no other food resources. She talked about how they um, didn't have enough clothing. <coughs> she didn't have shoes. Her mother would take cardboard and tie it around their feet so they could walk to school in the wintertime and not have their feet frozen. She talked about going to where the cows were in the wintertime in their bare feet and standing in the cow dung to keep their feet warm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the poverty in, is, was just horrific. Um, but she was a very gifted child, very bright. The community recognized that early on. The center of her universe and her family's universe was the church, the local church that they attended in Ruleville. Her father was actually a part-time Baptist minister. I don't know how often he spoke at this particular church, but they did belong to a church, and um, in the church hall after services, um, they would go down to the church hall, and Fannie Lou Hamer, as a little six, seven-year-old, would sing for everybody. She had a powerful voice, even as a child. And as she went through school, and the little bit that she did get, she... Um, uh, would recite things to the church community, poetry and stories um, for the, the church membership. So she was well known and well liked and her mother doted on her as you can imagine the mother losing seven children, four babies before Fannie Lou was born. She 
protected that baby fiercely to make sure that she would survive, and survive she did. And she also got that fierceness from her mother. Her mother, Fanny Lou Hamer, talked about um, her mother would carry a pistol in a bucket out into the field to protect her daughters and her young sons from the plantation bosses who could do whatever they wanted to, whether it was to whip the young boys or to grab one of the daughters or little girls and take them off in the woods and do unspeakable things. So she carried a gun. How she survived doing that, I don't know, but she was pretty fierce. Um, her siblings slowly moved away. Some of them went to Chicago, Indiana, uh, to other southern states, Alabama. Um, some grew up, got married, and then started sharecropping on neighboring plantations. So over time, it was Fannie Lou and her parents and a couple of older siblings um, in the house. So it got harder and harder to survive when there were uh, fewer and fewer hands uh, in the household to help. Um, there were good times in the early 1920s. The price of cotton went up, and <clears throat> the family did okay, well enough, so that her father was able to purchase a used truck and a couple of farm animals so he didn't have to lease them from the plantation owner. Um, a neighboring white farmer got, as Fannie Lou Hamer later said, got jealous of the, this black family's success, and he poisoned their animals and ruined the engine of the truck. <clears throat> so she said that set them right back and they had to start all over again. Um, there was great joy in uh, Hamer's life. She talked about the times with her family in the cabin, singing songs, listening to stories that her father would tell. They would roast peanuts and things like that. But music was a huge part of her life and when I was doing this research I realized that Ruleville was six miles from the place that they've identified as the birth of Delta Blues, uh, the Dockery Plantation. <clears throat> and so um, when, you, when I listen to Hamer singing, and there were recordings all over YouTube, Library of Congress, Smithsonian website, you can, you can listen to her sing. And there's, there are so many influences in her voice. One is definitely the field songs, the work songs out in the field, the, 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 the call and response, the, the rhythm of those very old uh, work songs in the field. There were also the spirituals from church and the gospel songs that she would sing. And then, of course, she would hear the Delta Blues. There were juke houses everywhere. And in fact, the town nearest where the plantation was that she worked on um, there was a street called uh, Greasy Street, which was where all the, the blues places and juke joints were. Now, Mississippi had been a dry state long before Prohibition, which started in the 1920s. And um, so people were allowed legally to brew their own beer or make their own wine or distill liquor for their own consumption. But of course, everybody kind of looked the other way. You pay off the sheriff and you could have a little juke joint. As long as you serve food, you could serve the liquor, but not charge for the liquor, ha, ha, ha. But anyway, there was this business going on everywhere. Um, her father, during the Great Depression, her father actually uh, made and sold like, liquor to help his family survive. She learned how to do it too. Be that as it may, so she definitely heard Delta Blues music everywhere she, <clears throat> she went. And I talked to some blues historians and blues musicians, and one of them said to me that um, Fannie Lou Hamer lived a blues-riddled life. So it comes out in her voice. She knows that. She just it, it expresses it no matter what type of song she sings, whether it's a spiritual, a gospel, a blues song, or one of those civil rights anthems. She had that blues sensibility. So um, in, so the, the the crash comes in 1929, but the farm sector had experienced a depression for several years before that. So they were already living a depression before the crash came in, across the country. Her mother in 1929 became blind. She was out in the field in the early months of 1929, chopping up roots along the edges of the field to get it ready. Something flew up in her eye, and because she could not access medical care, she went blind. 
Um, so Hamer by that time is uh, 12 years old and in sixth grade she had to drop out of school and work full time as a picker, cotton picker. Um, she was very proud of her skill as a teenager. She said that she could pick two to three hundred pounds of cotton a day and that was a great source of pride uh, for her. <clears throat> so she had to take care of her parents, uh, aging parents and blind mother. So in um, uh, 1939, she married a, a local guy on a neighboring plantation by the name of um, Charlie Gray. And um, I don't know much about their marriage. He ended up uh, signing up to join the forces in World War II, and she divorced him in 1943. And in the divorce complaint, he claimed that she was having an affair. And so that's probably true because within a year, she married this guy. Perry Pap Hamer, who was a sharecropper on another plantation. And um, he was, uh, I was talking to some of Hamer's relatives, and one of them said to me, Pap, Pap, he was the man. <laughs> and he was, he was tall and handsome, and he had a special position on the, the W.D. Marlowe plantation that he worked on. He was a mechanic. He knew how to fix trucks and cars and farm equipment. So he had an elevated status on the plantation. He also ran a juke joint on his, uh, in his house too. So he's doing bootleg liquor, he's got a juke joint, he's the man. Um, so Hamer, he and Hamer fell in love and got married in 1944 during the war. Um, they adopted two little girls, uh, uh, Virgie and Dorothy. Um, I was told by some of the relatives that the two little girls were actually children of relatives, but I couldn't, I couldn't match that up um, completely. One of them definitely was, I don't know about the other one, but they adopted these two girls to raise as their own as they were trying to have um, children of their own. Um, the Delta, uh, it prospered during the war, and then after the war, the price of cotton just exploded, and, um, and as I said, Pap was in a good position because he could, could deal with the machinery, whereas a lot of pickers ended up losing their jobs, sharecroppers lost their jobs, because once farm equipment became really popular and accessible after World War II, um, a lot of people lost their jobs, but Pap did not. So they're living in a state that is uh, one of the most brutal in the country. They, the violence, the racial violence is inexplicable. The Mississippi still holds the record for the greatest number of lynchings in the country. Um, Hines County actually has the highest number of recorded lynchings than any county in the United States. This was a nearby county to where they were living. So it's a violent place, it's, uh, it's oppressive, and um, uh, the, the control of the black po population seemed to the, be the primary goal of many white people and uh, politicians. Even though half the population in Mississippi was black, only 5% were registered to vote. And I should say, 5% were allowed to register to vote, and that 5% had a difficult time voting because once they went to a polling place, oftentimes they were met by guns or threats of violence, or they were told that if they voted, they would lose their job. So they, would, they were virtually powerless in Mississippi. Um, and so Hamer grew up in a world that was very violent. I talk about this in my book. There were incidences that happened in her community. Um, and it was, this is the world that they lived in and navigated to survive. But it, Mississippi was uh, just about the worst of the worst. Civil rights in Mississippi, the civil rights movement was sort of underground. The NAACP tried to establish a couple of offices in the state early on but they had to shut down because of threats, because people were afraid to join, because they didn't want to lose their jobs or have their house fire bombed, etc. So um, we get to the 19, no one's really paying attention across the nation, of course, Mississippi, oh, you know, Mississippi. 
But by the 1950s, things start to change. Of course, television is bringing images into every uh, living room across the country. We start with, there are many things that happened before 1954, but the Brown v. Board of Education decision by the Supreme Court in 1954 starts things escalating. Not only marching towards civil rights, but the violent reaction of white supremacists who do not want schools desegregated. They do not want their children and their white children in schools with black children. They don't want equality and justice. So the violence starts very quickly in the South after this decision of Brown v. Board of Education. So that's in uh, May of 1954. In August of 1955, a young 14-year-old boy, Emmett Till, is abducted by a white supremacist um, in a nearby county uh, in Mississippi, and he is tortured and murdered and left for dead about six miles from where Fannie Lou and Pap lived um, <clears throat> in Mississippi. Mamie Till, his mother, <clears throat> made sure that the world knew what happened to her son, and the pictures of his mutilated body were published all over the country and people who were not paying attention or refused to pay attention, they had to pay attention finally. <clears throat> the violence, <clears throat> excuse me, was, it was blatant, it was horrible, and then the, the mockery of a trial of the um, Millen brothers and others who were responsible for the murder, and of course they were acquitted by an all-white jury in Mississippi. It was a mockery of justice. But after Emmett Till was murdered in August of 1955, in December of 1955, Rosa Parks, who had been training and getting ready for this moment, chose uh, early December to refuse to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus, and uh, she was arrested. And of course, that's another step forward for the civil rights movement. It forces the federal government to start coming up with ways that they're going to address the issues. Now, later on, Fannie Lou Hamer claimed that she never heard anything about the civil rights movement. Living in Ruleville, Mississippi, it was another <coughs> world. She never even knew that there was civil rights activity going around on around the country. Well, she was not telling the truth. Um, in 1957, is, uh, we have uh, Little Rock, the desegregation. The National Guard has to go in and uh, protect the nine black students who were going to school in the, uh, trying to integrate the all-white school. And there are many other things happening in the 50s, and we're heading into 1960. And young people start to do the lunch counter sit-ins, where they are attacked by white supremacists, and they won't, you know, they're at Woolworths, and the white waitresses at the counters won't serve them, and they're getting attacked, as you can see in this photograph, by uh, white supremacists who poured hot coffee on them, mustard, ketchup, anything they could, pulled them off, beat them up. So this is hitting national news. It's really happening. Um, and the movement is moving forward. But again, Hamer's claiming she has no idea this is happening. In 1961, John Lewis, uh, Congressman John Lewis, uh, was part of a group that started doing the Freedom Rides. They got on buses in, um, in upper south states to test the laws that the federal government had passed over and over again about um, interstate buses had to be desegregated. You could not segregate a, a bus that went across state lines. And those bus terminals that hosted those buses had to be integrated too. No more separate bathrooms, no more colored counters, and I use that in parentheses, uh, no more refusing service to African American um, travelers. Well, when those buses started hitting the Deep South, they were firebombed, they were shot at, they were attacked. When they pulled into the terminals and they got out of the terminals to test the laws at the lunch counters there and use the bathrooms, they were attacked and beaten up brutally. Um, and this was hitting the national news. They were making the world know this is what's happening in the Deep South. So, um, Hamer, as I said, is living her life, raising her two daughters in um, Mississippi, and she and Pap are trying to have children of their own. She had several miscarriages. 
apparently a stillbirth or two. It's not really clear. Um, but one day, she, it was 1960, 1961, she was complaining to Mrs. Marlowe in the Marlowe home. Mrs. Marlowe uh, had Fanny um, Lou do house cleaning for her. And so she told Fanny Lou, you know, who was complaining about her inability to carry a baby to term, to have a baby with Pap, and she said, well, you should go to Dr. Charles Doro here at North Ruleville Hospital, and he will, you have, she had fibroid tumors. He'll remove the tumors, and then you'll be able to get pregnant and have a baby. So Fannie Lou Hamer goes to Dr. Charles Doro, and what does he do? He gives her a complete hysterectomy and did not tell her. He did not tell her. She found out when she was home in the cabin, recuperating, as you can imagine, from a hysterectomy, and the plantation cook came to her and said, Fannie Lou, I just heard Mrs. Marlowe tell her cousin that Dr. Doro sterilized you. And ha Hamer was stunned. She said that she just, the world just collapsed. Her mother just died. And here, this white doctor took her ability to have babies away and didn't even tell her. Never mind ask her permission, but didn't even tell her. She went into a deep, deep depression. And she relied on her profound faith and her determination to keep moving forward for her two girls. But she knew that there had to be a change. There had to be a change. Now, as I said, she kept telling audiences later in the 60s when she became very actively involved in the movement that she didn't know anything about the civil rights movement before she got involved in the 60s. But during the 1950s, she actually was secretly very involved. She used to go and try to get memberships to the NAACP. Once a year in May, there was this big, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, but it was called Mound Bayou Days. Mound Bayou, Mississippi was not too far from where Hamer lived. And there was a man who lived there, a famous guy by the name of uh, Reverend Dr. T.M. Howard. He was a doctor, he was an insurance broker, very well-to-do man. He owned a lot of property, big house in Mount Bayou. And he was secretly involved in uh, civil rights activity in Mississippi. And so he would hold these Mount Bayou days and they would have performers and speakers. Thurgood Marshall spoke there once, Mahala uh, Jackson sang there and they would have huge barbecue meals. And Hamer actually worked with a cousin of hers and they would get 500 chickens and barbecue those chickens over the four days um, for food for the people coming to it. And they would attend these secret civil rights meetings while the festival was going on. So Hamer was fully aware. Why she told audiences later on she had no knowledge, I don't know. I still am puzzling about that, but anyway. So she had reached this point in 1961 after this violation had happened to her. And she was trying to find the path forward. What was, what was it going to take? Where was the change that she was working for and hoping for? Well, at the same time, which she may not have been aware of, was that Ella Baker, who worked with Martin Luther King at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, had been watching these young people do the sit-ins and do the, um, the bus rides, the freedom rides. And she went to King and said, look, I think we need to bring these young people into the SCLC and groom them and they can be part of this movement. Well, King and the ministers didn't want the young people. They didn't want to, not that they didn't want them, they just didn't want to deal with another group. It was the SCLC, it was the ministers, they were going to do their thing. So Baker decided to organize the young people into the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. And so one of the, uh, John Lewis became one of them, but Robert Paris Moses, Bob Moses, became one of the, the most powerful and important members of SNCC. He was a Harvard-educated mathematician. He was teaching math in New York City. When he saw in the news these young people doing the sit-ins and the bus rides, and he thought, I need to be doing that too. So he went to Atlanta, and he met Ella Baker, and she said, great. 
I'm organizing you people and you're going to go out into to these places in the south and you're going to get into the community, you're going to get to know who the leaders are in these communities, you're going to ask those leaders and the people what do they need, what do they want. I don't want you smart kids from the north and wherever else going in and telling people what they need or what they want. You go in there and talk to the community, find out what they need and how you can help them get what they want. So Bob Moses ends up in Mississippi. He travels around, he's meeting all these people, and he brings in a bunch of other uh, workers, SNCC workers, and they end up at, um, they end up in Ruleville, and they have a meeting at the church that Hamer goes to with her family, William Chapel, there in Ruleville. And they set up this meeting, um, advertise it that they're there to talk about civil rights with the local black community, 200 people show up at the church. Um, white supremacists drive by, hurl some Molotov cocktails at the church, but they uh, get the, the fire out. They continue the program. Bob Moses and James Bevel and all these famous civil rights activists, they're all like 20, 22, 24 years old. They're there on stage talking to Fannie Lou Hamer and the community about what they wanted and they had been talking to people in the community and they heard that people wanted to vote and they wanted to register to vote but every time they tried to register they were refused or they would lose their job or their house would get shot at things like that so um, Bob Moses and his group said well we're gonna go we'll take you in a bus down to Indianola the Sunflower County um, capital and you will be there with you and you can take the test. Who's gonna come with us? So Hamer is one of 18 people out of the 200 that says she's willing to go and take the test. Remember, she's reached this point where, you know, actually she said soon after this, they've been trying to kill me all my life. If they kill me now, so be it, I'll be buried here. She, was, she had reached the end. She had seen the depths of the worst for her and she didn't, it didn't matter anymore. I have this picture here of um, this guy, the white guy is Theron Lind. He was a, uh, the clerk of the court in uh, Forest County, Mississippi. He was notorious for denying black people the right to vote. And he would, they would take the tests and he would throw them away. He would say you didn't pass. I think there, were, there was like a five or six year period there in the late 50s and the early 60s. He didn't pass one African American person uh, who took the test but illiterate white people he passed routinely. Fannie Lou Hamer tells stories about um, policemen uh, stopping her for a uh, traffic violation and she would have to fill out the ticket because the policeman was illiterate. Yeah. So he was f notorious and so he's sort of the stereotype of that southern clerk of courts that was refusing um, the ability, the, refusing black people the ability to vote. So they go to Indianola in the bus. A local guy has the bus. They rent it from him. He drives them down there. They arrive at the courthouse. They go up the steps, and they're stopped. And the clerk says, only two of you can come in at, you know, at the same time. So Fannie Lou and another guy are the first to go in and take this onerous test. They ask, you've got to interpret this section obscure stuff about the Mississippi Constitution. It's stupid. And um, so they each two by two, and as they're slowly two by two taking the test, all these white supremacists start showing up and they're driving around in their cars and beeping their horns and waving Confederate flags and just, you know, throwing things, water and coffee and stuff at the people waiting outside to take the test. The group endures this whole thing. They get back on the bus at like four o'clock. They start heading out of town and the white supremacists are circling around them and trying to crash them and then they get stopped by the police who arrest the driver for driving a bus the wrong color yellow. A <laughs> hundred dollar <laughs> ticket, yeah. So everyone's freaking out because uh, the white supremacists are circling the car and they're doing all these scary things and Hamer begins to sing to calm everybody down. So at that moment, the SNCC workers, Bob Moses and others, realized that Hamer was a leader. 
So they get back to Ruleville after bailing the poor driver out of jail, and they get back to Ruleville, and Fannie Lou Hamer goes out to the plantation, and she hadn't been in the house a couple of minutes when bang, bang, bang on the door, it's Mr. Marlowe. And he's furious, and he tells Fannie Lou, I want you to go back down to the courthouse tomorrow, and you pull your registration application. And uh, she said, no, Mr. Marlowe, I'm not going to do that. I went down there to register for me, not for you. And he said, then, you're out of here. And he evicted her right then and there that night. Pap had to stay behind to finish the crop in September and October, because if he didn't, he would owe Mr. Marlowe, I don't know, a lot of money. So he had to stay on the plantation to finish the season. Hamer moved in town, but the ho she went from house to house. And one of the houses she stayed in, she left. And the next night, they, the white supremacists went by and shot up the house. Mm -hmm. So, oh, and the bus driver ended up losing his other job. There were other people on the bus who lost their jobs just because they tried to register to vote. So Hamer was distraught. SNCC decided they would track her down. She moved out of the county because it was just so much, there were so many threats against her. So um, they hired her to be a field worker for SNCC to work with young people. And that's what she did. And she became a powerful, powerful voice for uh, the movement in Ruleville and eventually the movement at, at, as, as a whole. Now, they started, SNCC started bringing in some big activists into Mississippi. They would have rallies to encourage people to try to register to vote. And you can listen to some of these rallies online at the Smithsonian. It's called the Moon Collection. They're recordings of some of the rallies that she's involved in. And the early rallies, you see there are a lot of men who get up on the stage. There were middle class black men and, and other men from outside Mississippi who would come and they would do these rallies and give speeches. And frankly, some of them were really boring. Some of them were really amazing. But you could see the crowds getting restless. You could hear them, uh, not see them, but you could hear them getting restless. And when that would happen, they would call Fannie Lou Hamer up to sing. And it would get everybody focused. and. Would, would she get those audiences rocking, clapping, shouting back and forth to her, cheering, yelling, screaming, laughing, praying? It was amazing how she could transform a crowd that was losing interest. Well, she noticed that too, um, that they were, that the, the men sometimes lost the interest of the crowd and she could get a lot from the crowd. Well, they started letting her give speeches on her own. And she was such a powerful speaker. She started headlining these rallies because people would flock for miles and miles around because word would get out about Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, one of the SNCC workers that I interviewed, um, Dr. Leslie Burr McLemore, uh, who still lives in Mississippi, he said that, um, uh, it's funny because every time I interviewed some of the uh, civil rights workers that worked with her, and they were young people when they met her, so she's like in her 40s, and they're in their early 20s, or teenagers at the time. Uh, Dr. Uh, McLemore was actually like 16 years old when he met her. And they, when they talk, their voice all of a sudden changed. And when they started talking about her, like she was, th just the things they would say in their voices they just couldn't believe that they were fortunate enough to be in the presence of greatness like Fannie Lou Hamer. So Leslie, um, Dr. Uh, McLemore said to me that Hamer was the star, the person that all of them were wowed by. No one equaled her storytelling. She testified, preached, led them in rousing freedom songs, and was the center of attraction. <coughs> Excuse me. I got something dry in my throat here. <coughs> want some water? Yeah, I should. Thank you. Um, another civil rights veteran said she was a powerhouse. She would shine her light. People caught the spirit. So there was no doubt that she was a, a leader. So SNCC started to train her. They sent her to different training sessions in Memphis. She worked with John Lewis. She'd learn nonviolent protest techniques how to resist the violence perpetrated against her and others during their rallies. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, 
and she would, um, they were training her how to teach people to take those tests and also <clears throat> teaching her about the Constitution, what her rights were, um, civil rights that she could teach people in the community to stand up for their rights and, and even though that was a dangerous thing to do. Um, so she was always taking classes. Well, in June of um, 1963, she and a group of SNCC workers um, were, went to South Carolina for a two-week training session, and they decided to take the buses from um, <clears throat> Greenwood or Greenville, Mississippi, where the headquarters were, and then all the way to Georgia and South Carolina. They vowed that on the buses they would not segregate on the buses and that they would test all the facilities and all the terminals along the way which they did and they were not uh, harassed or, or no one said anything to them. They were served, so they had no problems going out. At the end of the two weeks, they decided to do the same thing on the way back. Well, they were 30 miles from the end of their trip coming back in um, June uh, 9, 1963, <clears throat> and they stopped at the bus terminal in Winona, Mississippi, Staley's Cafe, and uh, Hamer, was, it was a hot day, Hamer's on the bus, she didn't want to get off the bus, she just, you know, so, but the young people did get off the bus. They went to the lunch counter, <clears throat> the waitresses refused to serve them. Um, they wanted to go to the restroom and a police off officer was there and said, no, you've got to go around the corner to the colored bathroom. So one of these SNCC workers um, started taking down the license plates of all the police that were starting to arrive at the terminal. So the police arrested her and um, several of the other SNCC workers. And when Hamer got off the bus, she yelled to them because uh, she was seeing them getting arrested and she said, what's happening? And Anel Ponder, the black woman on the right there, uh, she was a 32, 33 year old teacher from Atlanta who had joined this group in Mississippi. Um, and she said, don't worry, just get back to headquarters and tell them what's happening and knowing that they, the headquarters would call and get lawyers down to the Winona jail immediately and get them bailed out. Um, but the police, so what were they arrested for? For, oh, disturbing the peace. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that. Disturbing the peace because, well, they wouldn't get served and, uh, anyway, disturbing the peace. So they throw Hamer in a police car, too, and they take them all to the Winona jail. But she didn't even go in? She didn't even go in. They just arrested her. <clears throat> she hadn't even stepped off the bus. They pulled her off the steps of the bus. So um, over, well, that was the Sunday. Sunday afternoon, they were all brutally, brutally beaten, including Hamer, who was also sexually assaulted. Mm. Yep. And she nearly died. Her wounds, she actually had kidney damage that uh, she suffered from for the rest of her life. And her left eye was damaged, had ner nerve damage as a result of the beating. She was beaten from head to toe. This is from her FBI file, this photograph. Um, it isn't an arrest picture. It's uh, the FBI agents took pictures. They wanted to get pictures of all her bruises. This is when uh, she was finally let out of jail four days later. Um, and the FBI photographs are horrifying. I, you know, I don't show them here because most of them are her naked body with the bruising that is unbelievable. <clears throat> After she had been beaten, she was barely <laughs> conscious, and she was put back in the cell with another young woman, an 18-year-old woman by the name of Uvester Simpson. And they were about to take Uvester out and beat her, but there was a phone call to the jail, which everyone now believes was probably either the FBI or someone from SNCC uh, or uh, Martin Luther King's organization saying, you know, where are these people? So they stopped beating them. Uvester did not get beaten. But she sat there with Hamer in the jail, and Hamer was drifting in and out of consciousness. And um, Uvester said that Hamer wanted her to sing the gospel, walk with me, Jesus, walk with me, to help her stay alive. Mm -hmm. So they get it. Well, let me just finish up on this for a second. So they get out of jail um, on that, the 14th 
or whatever day it was, um, that Wednesday, uh, Medgar Evers, famous uh, leader of the NAACP in Mississippi, was murdered that night. And they didn't know about it until they got out of jail, uh, you know, early in the afternoon after he had been murdered. So Hamer's head is about to explode like this, you know, this is another rebirth for her. She could have gone and hidden at home and never stepped out of her cabin again. But she was more determined than ever, more determined than ever. She and Anel Ponder left the headquarters in Greenville. When they got there, FBI was waiting to take their testimony, and Hamer said, I'm not talking to you. She didn't trust the local FBI guys, because many of them were local guys. So they went to Atlanta, where she gave testimony to uh, Ella Baker's group, um, lawyers from the SCLC. And she also gave testimony to a reporter for the Atlanta newspaper there. And there she hinted in her story to the reporter that she had been raped. She didn't come out and say I was raped, but she described what one of the officers did to her. Then they flew immediately to New York City where they gave more statements to the NAACP there because Hamer wanted to be sure everything was recorded. She didn't trust what was going to be recorded in Mississippi. And then they left New York and by Friday they were in Washington, D.C. at the Department of Justice uh, talking to um, St. John Barrett who was um, uh, the uh, Assistant Attorney General. And that's where a lot of photographs were taken of Hamer. And they repeated their testimony over and over again because they wanted to make sure that their voices were heard. <clears throat> uh, it took her months to recover. I don't know what she told Pap about what had happened to her because um, she was very protective of him because black men were especially vulnerable in Mississippi. If they spoke up, they could be murdered. And it happened often enough that she spent a lot of time trying to protect him from, uh, he had a temper, and she didn't want him losing his temper and ending up <coughs> dead. So that summer, after the assault, is um, Martin Luther King's March on Washington. The world is just becoming more and more aware of what's happening, and this is an incredible event. But white supremacists, they snap right back, and they're not going to let any success they bombed the church in Birmingham, Alabama, where the four little children were killed. <coughs> so any gains were always met by incredible violence by white supremacists. So Hamer and the SNCC workers helped found a new Democratic Party in Mississippi called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party because the all-white Mississippi party wouldn't let any black people into it, so they formed their own party. And the white politicians kept telling the world, look, we understand what you're saying, but black people just don't want to vote. That's why, you know, they can register to vote. They can go to any courthouse and they can register to vote as long as they pay their poll taxes and they can pass the test, but they can vote. And um, so the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party wanted to show the world that black Mississippians indeed want to vote. So they set up their own polling stations. They taught people how to register to vote, even though it was all mock elections. But they had precinct, precinct meetings, and they set up the whole system so that people would understand how it worked and not to let anybody say they didn't want to vote. So here's just a picture of some SNCC workers with a ballot box outside of a church somewhere um, trying to get people interested in trying to register to vote. <clears throat> They also conceived of uh, Freedom Summer in 1964. They conceived of this idea to bring, they wanted to bring a thousand young people from around the country to Mississippi during the summer of 1964 to register people to vote and to do whatever anybody wanted in these communities, not just register to vote, but also to do more things. Um, here they're at a training session in um, a college in Ohio. Um, 800 students eventually uh, made their way to Mississippi and spread out to different communities. While the sessions training was going on in Ohio in uh, the middle of June 1964, these three young SNCC workers were murdered in, uh, outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi. 
They had gone to investigate the burning of a black church, which seemed to happen every week at that point. And um, they were taken up and arrested, and Klan members brought, got them out of jail, and took them, tortured them, killed them, and buried them in an earthen dam. So they were reported missing while this training session is going on in Ohio. Some of those students packed up and left and went back home. They did not want to, the, the, the reality of life or death was too intense. Um, it would be 44 days before the bodies were eventually found of these three um, SNCC workers. <clears throat> so they fanned out across Mississippi. They worked in communities. They built, um, they, they, brought, they built 47 freedom schools uh, where adults and children could attend in the summertime uh, to learn how to read and write and do math and etc. Um, they built 13 community centers and they offered um, uh, many literacy classes for adults who had basically been denied an education uh, all along anyway. And they tried to convince people to register to vote and there were a lot of people who were willing to take that risk at that point and try to register to vote. And um, many of them lost their jobs, as I said. Some of them were shot at. Other workers were killed and or attacked. Many of them were arrested and put into the famous, notorious Parchman prison where they were beaten and attacked, starved. It was terrible. Um, but these young people persevered. So um, early August, they had their precinct meetings, and their plan was to um, challenge the seating of the all-white Mississippi Democratic Party at the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City in late August. And they were going to choose their uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, MFDP, was going to choose their own delegates and go to the convention and demand a hearing so that they could be seated to represent all the people of Mississippi, not the white, all white Mississippi delegation. So here's their, their convention. They elected delegates. To, um, Hamer was one of them, and 68 other people were elected to go to Atlantic City. They arrive there, <clears throat> and they have to appear before the Credentials Committee to plea their case. Martin Luther King came and pled for them. He gave a five-minute speech. Other Mississippi um, activists gave little talks. Uh, Rita Schwerner, the wife of Mickey Schwerner, one of those SNCC workers that was murdered that I showed the picture of, uh, she spoke. <clears throat> and then Fannie Lou Hamer got up to speak. And I talked to people who were in the room at the time. And again, their voices change in awe that there, some of them pointed to this moment, her speaking in that room, as changing their lives. <clears throat> she started talking. Um, I mentioned in the book that she's wearing a borrowed dress, borrowed shoes, a borrowed purse, because she didn't have appropriate clothing to wear to the convention. Um, and so she's sitting there. You can see a portion of this online on YouTube, and you can hear the whole thing <clears throat> on other areas of YouTube. And she said, she, she was unbelievable. If you listen to her, she tells the story. She tells the world where she lives. In case somebody wants to come and kill her, they have the address. They can come right to her house and kill her. <clears throat> and she tells the world about not being able to vote and the violence that's perpetrated on the communities and her. She tells her story. And the people that I talked to said, Grown men were crying listening to her give her speech. Some of the white members of the Credentials Committee started crying listening to her. She was so powerful, her voice. It rises and falls. It cracks a few times. She's so powerful in her speech. She, sometimes her voice drops off and then it rises up powerfully. And she says, <clears throat> that um, she tells them about all the violence, and she says, all of this is on account of we want to register to become first-class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily, because we want to live as decent human beings in America? 
and the audience just explodes in clapping and cheering. Other people, like the white Mississippi delegation, they're all shaking their heads, they're disgusted. But what happened was, all this is covered live by NBC News, so it's in the middle of the afternoon, August, it's covered live. Halfway through her speech, President Johnson, who's hoping to get the nomination, the Democratic nomination in November, is watching at the White House, the live coverage, and he starts hearing Fannie Lou Hamer's speech. And at about three minutes through, he's like, uh-oh, this isn't good for me. Because he needed those white delegates, all of the white Southern Democratic delegations to vote for him because they were threatening not to. George Wallace was actually threatening to start his own party. And so Johnson wanted to keep those white delegations together to vote for him. So he didn't want to seat the MFDP because he knew if he did that, all the other Southern delegations would bolt. In his, uh, so he has these secret recordings that he recorded a lot in the White House, and you can hear them online at the uh, LBJ um, uh, library website. And the things he says about these Southern white delegates, he hated them, he hated them, and he called them racist, and he said, you know, these people, meaning Hamer and the MFDP folks, they're right, they deserve to vote, they need to vote, but he, couldn't do, he didn't feel he could do anything about it. So three minutes into her speech, he's like, uh-oh. So he immediately calls for a press, press conference. And NBC News interrupts her speech. And you can see this online. And they say, the president has something to say to us. So they go to the press room at the White House. And there's Johnson at the podium. And he says, I just want to tell you all to remember that nine months and six days and so many hours ago, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Texas, and Governor Connolly was seriously wounded. He says a few more words, and then he leaves the podium. So NBC goes back to the hearing room, and Hamer is just finishing and leaving the table. Johnson's like, phew, I dodged that bullet. Oh, no, he didn't, because NBC News replayed her testimony that night on national television so the whole country saw her. Thousands of telegrams flooded the White House, Congress, and the, um, the headquarters in Atlantic City. She had changed the world with that one speech. She did not get what she wanted. The protests grew and grew outside the convention. Um, here is a, a group of people. So hundreds and thousands of people started heading to Atlantic City to support Fannie Lou Hamer and, and MFDP. Here she is outside the convention. She's with Mickey Schwerner, that's him on the poster, and his parents there, and um, other delegates and other supporters who wanted to, the MFDP to be seated. But Johnson, was, he couldn't give them, he couldn't seat them. So they got into negotiations. Hubert Humphrey, his presumed VP at the time, started negotiating with them. They realized that Hamer was you couldn't negotiate with her. It was like, they wanted the 24 seats, she wanted the 24 seats, it's all or nothing. So in a way, she was a little bit of a political neophyte because there was, there was no way they were gonna give her the 24 seats. These are the empty seats for Mississippi. Hamer and her colleagues uh, were not given passes to be on the main floor where only delegates were allowed to be. So other people from other states would give them their passes so they could get down on the floor. And Hamer and Bob Moses and others went to, and they tried to sit in the Mississippi seats. And then the security would come and escort them out. And they did it so often that security came and unbolted the chairs from the, the arena or the, the, the room. And uh, so they just went and sat on the floor. But they were persistent. But the negotiations went on and on and on. And Martin Luther King and his, um, some of his advisors, like Ralph Abernathy and others, they negotiated two non-voting seats for MFDP and the seating of the all-white delegation. Well, Hamer was furious. But Martin Luther King, he was kind to Hamer, but his al uh, some of his allies were not. 
Um, they were, these were powerful black ministers, middle, upper class men, and they disdained Hamer. And one of them told her that she was an embarrassment with her accent, her lack of education. She had a couple of gold teeth up, so when she spoke, they shined and glistened. You can see it in the tape when you watch the stuff on YouTube. And her clothes, as I said, were borrowed. And one of them actually criticized her clothes and said, you know, you shouldn't be here. You, this is, you're, just, you're just low. He had no respect for her. There was just this elitism that oozed out of him. She didn't have the same education. So she left there furious and felt betrayed. She did run for office uh, that year against uh, white politicians. She lost, of course, um, but they because black people couldn't vote. So she and her colleagues, who other women who ran for office in Mississippi that November, uh, challenged the seating of the white male politicians who were elected, and they went to Congress in Washington, D.C., and filed their complaint. And eventually they were heard, their complaint was heard, and they, um, the Congress voted and did not vote to seat them, but they were the first African-American women to ever sit on the floor of Congress, and the first Mississippians since 1870. So they made history and uh, the press covered all of it. So she kept fighting and fighting. Um, there, you know, the battle wasn't over. And the government, uh, Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 before the convention. And then in 1965, he passed the 1965 Civil Rights Legislation that changed everything. Voting, you know, no longer, you couldn't do tests, you couldn't do um, uh, poll taxes. You could not stop people from registering to vote. You couldn't refuse them. Some Mississippi clerks uh, in the courts um, still refused it, like Theron Lind. He, he had, got hauled into jail a couple of times, brought to trial. He was terrible. Um, but eventually, it did work. People were able to register to vote. She did work with Martin Luther King a couple of times. Here they are, March Against Fear. Um, James Meredith, who was the African-American man who tried to integrate old Miss, um, he continued to fight to uh, open up the doors of Mississippi's premier university and um, they had this march against fear across the state where they were attacked and harassed by white supremacists and Martin Luther King led the walk uh, part of the way and Hamer did too but you can see by their body language they just don't connect. She would sing, he would talk to reporters, he'd give a speech but she was the one that everybody got energized by. Um, so it, they just didn't, they had different ways of activating and different ways of dealing with the movement and different leadership styles. She was grassroots, he was a national figure. Um, all her hard work did pay off because in 1968 she and her reformed uh, Freedom Democratic Party, it was called the Loyalist Democratic Party, they challenged the seating of the Mississippi All-White Party in Chicago at the Democratic Convention that year in 68. And the Credentials Committee kicked the white Mississippi Party out and seated the uh, diverse party of Hamer's party on the floor. And when she got up to speak, there was a standing ovation for her. She fought to change the Democratic platform. She kept working for uh, universal health care universal child, uh, early childhood education, um, issues to address food insecurity, housing insecurity, et cetera, et cetera. She, and she wanted state delegations from every state to be diverse, um, gender-wise and uh, race-wise. So she was a powerful person in changing the structure of the Democratic Party. <clears throat> um, the movement started to move on without her, though. Um, the Vietnam War was draining a lot of energy from the country and young people and um, uh, you know the world was just changing around her and a lot of the young SNCC workers, some of them went on to become part of the Black Panther Party, other splinter civil rights groups, others went back to school, got jobs. So she remained active in Mississippi, she did a lot of speeches around the country at universities um, so she was still pretty famous, and here she was against the Vietnam War, 
she was, uh, here she is in, at Lafayette Square in front of the White House at a rally. Um, and her point of view was that if um, young Mississippi uh, men could not, black men could not vote and could not vote for freedom, how, why should they be sent to Vietnam to fight for the freedom of um, Vietnamese when they couldn't be free back in Mississippi? So that was her reasoning. So, uh, but here she is rallying up a crowd, and I think this is like the day before, or day of, or day after uh, an inauguration or some, some big event. She um, was always very concerned about the local community in Mississippi, and so she set up um, a pig farm or a pig exchange. So she would give out uh, pigs, or one or two pigs, every spring to needy families, and they could keep the pigs throughout the summer, and if they had piglets, they could keep the piglets and return to, to the pig farm that could then be sent out the next year so that people would have food throughout the winter. Um, and then she also had a farm co-op where she ended up with uh, several hundred acres over time so that local people could have their own farms and grow their own food um, so that they wouldn't suffer with food insecurity in the wintertime. <clears throat> it wasn't so successful in Ruleville and the area, but there were other counties where these programs were very successful. She, um, she was uh, active with um, the National Council of Negro Women and she also helped uh, found other really important civil rights and local uh, organizations. She was very much into uh, early childhood education and helped support the settlement of um, early, you know, like kindergartens and Head Start in, in Mississippi. Um, but at, by the time she's the early 70s, she's very, very sick because of the kidney damage that she endured. She had hypertension, diabetes, and um, you know she was just in failing health. She helped uh, found the National Women's Political Caucus with Shirley Chisholm and uh, Betty Friedan and Bella Abzug and, and all the others, Gloria Steinem. She was a powerful, powerful figure on the national stage when it came to women's movement. However, she was an incredibly incredibly conservative uh, woman. She was against abortion and she was against birth control. And the young women in the movement were shocked. They could understand the anti-abortion stance, but anti-birth uh, control, they could not understand that. And Marilee Evers, uh, <clears throat> Medgar Evers' wife, you know, she just couldn't believe it. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Congresswoman, they, all these, they were all younger women, and they just could not get through to Hamer, and they could not understand why she was against birth control. <clears throat> she ended up developing breast cancer, and um, she died of complications of breast cancer and her diabetes and everything else in March of 1977. She was pretty much alone by then. Her, um, the community had drifted away, deeply in debt because of all the health care bills that she had, she and Pap had, so it was, a, it was a sad ending to her life. There were thousands of people who showed up at her funeral, however, and um, the, the speeches were incredible, and the people that came to speak about how she influenced them and made them better people, and they left in awe of her. So I'd like to end with this photograph, because she's with people who loved her, and people did follow her. <clears throat> And she did have happy times, even though by the time she died at the age of 59, um, she had so much more to do and give, but it was, she was, it was too soon. There's one thing I'd like to read to you, and I should have interjected a little bit earlier, but she said something that I think is, this is what made her so popular. She was so amazing with words. She was all about, you can't fight hate with hate. You have to fight hate with love. And she took that from her deep faith, and, and she tried to practice that every day. And she said, you know, I really don't hate any man. There's got to be something wrong psychologically with a person to have me beaten because of the color of my skin. Hate is like cancer, she said. It eats away at a human being until they become nothing but a shell. That same hate will make you stay up at night. That's the reason you have the Ku Klux Klan and all these other hate groups that a man should stay up all night trying to figure out he can, how he can fix a sheet to make a point in it,
to go out and terrorize another human being is really stupid. Mm -hmm. The point is not in the sheet, it's in his head. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So there you go. Any questions, comments? Yes, thank you. No, white people could take the test, but if, even if they were illiterate, the court of the clerk court would just say passed. So now we don't have to. I never took a test, but uh, yeah. Well, no, only certain states had tests. So oh, okay. yeah, yeah. It was in the it was all set up to to uh, prevent black voting. Uh, yes. What do you think about today with the white supremacy? So this is really amazing. When I started this project, I did not know we'd end up where we are today. Yeah, I know. When I started this in 2016, um, things, well, think, you know, I remember when Obama was elected, President Obama was elected, and friends and colleagues said, oh, this is great, now we're in a post-racial society. This is all, you know, we've elected a black president, racism's gone, and I'm thinking, because I, you know, I study this stuff, I'm thinking, hmm, yeah, no. It's gotten worse. It's, but you know what? It was always there. It was a lot of it was underground. We didn't see it or we didn't look for it. But boy, it came roaring back after he was out of office. And now, and so I see the voting restrictions because they overturned parts of the 1965 Voting Rights Act in Shelby case in 2013. They overturned portions of that. So now the states can gerrymander. They can have serious voter ID restriction policies. Um, they can, they can uh, limit the number of uh, voting polling stations. So, you know, you could have one polling station in an all-black county, so people have to drive, you know, two hours to get to vote. They can do that now. So this is what's happened. They've been allowed. The white supremacists were always there, just it's waiting. To, just yeah, just powers. waiting. And who gave them the ideas? Yeah, and they will always be there. Education, I, I hope can, but I didn't know how powerful this story would be for me and as a lesson that we cannot take the, our eyes off the prize. Yes? Um, one of the civil rights gains is little increments. I uh, was wondering, you had mentioned that um, one of those murders, it was a mockery of justice. Yeah. I don't know what year that was, but then uh, compared to the year where the three uh, state members were murdered, I was wondering what that, that was uh, a time difference right. was and if um, there was any justice later on the three uh, yes. individuals that were murdered. Uh, later on. Right. I was just wondering if there was any gain. Yes, so um, Emmett Till was murdered in 50, 1955. There was a trial. They were let off. They admitted to the murder. It didn't matter. They were let off. Just awful. And they ended up uh, opening a gas station right across the street from where Hamer lived in Ruleville. Anyway, and then the, um, the Mississippi uh, Freedom Summer murders the three young men. Um, they uh, there were people arrested, they were, the trials were mockery, and um, then the FBI came back in the 1990s and they arrested, I think the guy's name was Beckwith, and he did end up getting tried and convicted and went to prison. Now recently, um, the woman, there was a, the story goes that Emmett is visiting Mississippi for the summer because he lived in Chicago and his mother's family was in Mississippi and he went with his cousins to the local store and um, supposedly the woman there, whatever her name was, um, claimed that Emmett uh, touched her or something or t made a pass at her. And then later, someone said, well, he whistled at her. Well, you know, whatever that was, she complained to her husband, who was a bad guy, and his cousin, who was a police guy. And they came back, and they abducted 14-year-old Emmett Till, and they went and tortured, tortured him and murdered him. And they, uh, so anyway, she, her name is Carol, uh, is still alive. And the arrest warrant for her back in 1960. Uh, in 1955, had never been executed. The warrant was in files in Mississippi that was discovered like a year ago. 
And so there is a limitation on when the arrest warrant is still good for if it's been executed. It was never executed. So now there's a huge movement to have the DA execute that warrant and have her arrested. Because, you know, the restitution hasn't been achieved yet. It's not right. She lied. You know, she's responsible as much as the guys who murdered little Emmett Till. And she, and she never apologized. Never that. apologized. She's, mm. the, the mother said she, would, she wouldn't even take the apology anymore. Yeah, it's too late. It's too late. But um, the, the story was he bumped into that lady. Well, there are lots of versions he, of it. it said, yeah. This is what the mother said. He, he bumped into the lady and he said, excuse me, and then they said that made up all the yeah. other stuff. Yeah, it's just horrible. So that's the resolution. So I, I think, I, I doubt they're going to arrest the woman. Who knows? It's Mississippi. Yeah. Did her husband outlive her? In other yes. words, when she died in 77? Yes. So, and what about the two daughters? So um, uh, Dorothy, the older one, died um, in 1966. She was married and had uh, two little babies. And one, uh, after she gave birth to the second one, she developed anemia. And because of lack of access to health care, she died. Oh. Yeah. So Pap and um, Fannie Lou raised those two granddaughters as their own daughters, um, Jackie and Laura. Um, and then the other daughter, Virgie, um, she ended up growing up and getting married and having children of her own. She died like in 2018 maybe, uh, or maybe maybe a little bit sooner than that. And the, one of the granddaughters died in 2018. Jackie is the only one that's still alive. So Pap, Pap actually took care of the girls when <clears throat> Hamer was out doing the civil rights activity. And then um, he, after, um, Hamer died, the, the two little granddaughters were still little, so he raised them, and then he died in 1994. How old was he? He was, um, let's see, he was 82 years old. Yeah. Quite an amazing life. Yeah. But listening, talking to these civil rights activists who knew Hamer, I talked to these two lawyers that um, they were young, uh, recently graduated law students who had just passed their bar and they were working for a legal aid society in Mississippi to help you know, people who had no money um, file complaints or fight things in court. And these two young lawyers had to go to her house because she would call legal aid and say, my neighbor needs help, send somebody down. So they go there and they were really nervous, both of them said, because they were meeting the famous Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm -hmm. And it was like 1970, and she wanted them to help her neighbor who had purchased a couch, and she had missed one $10 payment on the couch, and the company was trying to uh, repossess the couch. So um, the two lawyers said that uh, both of them had to go back into their records to remember what the case was, because they were so in awe of being in her presence, they couldn't. They couldn't remember anything about sitting there, except they just could not believe they were sitting with such greatness. It's really powerful. I, you know, ugh, such a tragedy. She died so young, but she really changed a lot of people's lives and was very courageous. And um, you know, she she just knew what was right. She wasn't going to stop. Much like Harry Tubman, you know, you just know what's right, and convince other people to stand up too. Yes. The book is available on Amazon? Yes, thank you. Yes. So, uh, yeah. we just punch up Amazon. Amazon, and it'll be there. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, you said she had to quit school at 12. Yeah. Um, how did she find her words? So, I think about this a lot. She, um, so she's, she, her education wasn't only in the classroom. It was out in those fields, at home, in church. So her father's this part-time Baptist minister. He could not read or write, but of course he, he had a voice. And her mother did too, and so did other people in the community. So I think she learned how to speak through them and through the community. And from the time that she was little, she had confidence because the community lifted her up. They literally put her on a table to perform. So she had that confidence and um, 
And some people I talked to, they said that they remember relatives talking about how they thought Fannie Lou was crazy before she even got involved in the, the public uh, civil rights movement. They'd be out in the field, so she was literate, and so the plantation uh, owners would let her keep the book. So at the end of the season, they would weigh the cotton, and she would keep, you know, she would write down all the weights and stuff. And um, so when the bosses weren't around. But she knew that the bosses cheated the sharecroppers. They would take these weights that had been hollowed out or altered so that it would weigh the cotton less than it actually was. So Hamer got weights that she kept hidden. And when the bosses weren't looking, she'd switch out the weights so that the, the cotton would be weighed accurately. And of course, everyone was grateful that she would do that, but they thought, thought for sure she was going to get caught and killed, because she probably would have been killed for that. And she was like, it's wrong. I'm just taking what's ours. But how did she do it if, they, if she couldn't let them know she was literate? No, no, she knew, they knew she was literate. She was oh. one of the few that could do the books. Oh. Um, so they let her do, it was easier to have, you know, a black woman. How threatening could a black woman be? That's the reasoning. Yeah. yeah. So then she got the money that they deserved. No, no, yeah, so they got paid what they were supposed to. Yeah, and she would dig her with, so sometimes they would get on buses and they would go from plantation to plantation after they had done their own plantations. And so she would dig her with the, the field bosses to get two, three, or four cents, depending on the, the landscape, what was there. And so everyone just, because she would not let up, she would not let up. Yeah, yes? Uh, you mentioned that she, at 12, she quit school to go pick cotton, <clears throat> and that she picked two to three hundred pounds of cotton a day. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. I picked cotton, and I couldn't pick a hundred pounds a day. Uh, mm -hmm. But. Uh, if she could do that. Well, that's what she said well, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> she was a little bit of a fabulous, but you never I, know. <laughs> yeah, I, that's, that's kind of extravagant. But isn't cotton got all, um, like, thorns on it and stuff too? Oh, it, they cut your hands? When you pick it, what's it like to pick well, it? Well, it depends. On, I mean, there was uh, burrs on the cotton, yeah. so you'd have to be very careful. You learn how to do you that. You learn yeah. how to do it. Yeah. 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 She, she told a lot of stories. She said that her grandmother was born a slave and that she died in 1960 at the age of 136. Oh. You know, That's a bit I know, it's yeah. like she would, I think she just liked to hear herself say these crazy things. <laughs> well, no, I did the genealogy and her grandmother did not. No. Did not. <laughs> How old was your grandmother when she died? Her grandmother was probably about, um, let's see, she was probably about 65 or 70. Yeah, yeah but she had 20 children, 23 children. Mm -hmm. if, if, so I know that she had three children after slavery. Mm -hmm. Hamer said she had 20 children before slavery. So, yeah. Bringing all her life. <laughs> uh, well, this is what, you know, it's... Okay. Yes? You know, we can joke about her maybe uh, embellishing stories, mm -hmm. but... If she's speaking, you know, part of her position is to listen to other people's stories too and see if she can get that story out there. Mm. So part of it is that too. Right. She just wants things to be heard. Right, right. And she and so she was raised with the stories about her grandmother. And so it was her way of testifying in a way, so she had the dates all off and the whole thing, it didn't matter. She was testifying to her grandmother's experience of being traded from one slave owner to the next, having all these children, and then having children in freedom, and one of them was her mother. Um, so it, it's just, she was testifying, yeah, to the truth. Yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> Answer. <laughs> I've never heard of her. Is it, is it, you know, like Martin Luther King is the big deal. I know. So, that, so um, there are certain, you know, black icons that take up all the oxygen in the room, just like white icons. They take up the oxygen from every other person that made huge contributions. That's why it's important to tell these stories. And of course, she died young, so that, um, that's really hard because if she had lived another 20 years, it would have been different. She would have been actively involved in 
the National Women's Political Caucus. She might have actually ended up getting elected in Mississippi. We don't know. Um, so she was, it, she just died too young, too young. But I think it's also a comment about the, the media and how they present different characters involved in these kind of situations. It's, it's, it was always the white guy or, or right. always Martin I know, or, it, yeah. Yeah. Same with Harriet Tubman. She is like this icon, but there were, I mean, there weren't other people like Harriet Tubman, but there were other people doing work like she did. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and Hamer worked with some powerful women. Ella Baker, I mean, she was an incredible human being, and if it wasn't for her, there would, have been, would not have been SNCC, and they were a powerful force uh, for change. And so, you know, for Hamer, she said that they were the new kingdom on earth, the SNCC, those young SNCC people. And she said that there was more Christianity in those young people than she'd ever seen in church. Yeah. She admired them so much, and they really admired her, really admired her. Have they always had gerrymandering? Yeah. Oh, it's been around since the be dawn of time. I know, but, you know, yeah, it should be, but it's... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so complicated. But the way they're doing it now, it's it's a really offensive and awful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's offensive. They don't let them have the AP African um, studies. Yeah. But and every kid them. should they learn about the studies, studies. They should learn about the Civil Rights Movement and Fannie Lou Hamer Everybody and Harriet Tubman. Some, some of the kids it's, that signed up for, for white kids, they want to It's right. Religion. It's American yeah. history. Yeah. You know, it isn't, it isn't just African Americans who this history happened to. It was all of us. So we're all part of this, and it's just, uh, we have to honor them because they tried to make this a more perfect union and a better democracy. Yes? Did they do anything about the doctor that sterilized Oh her? my gosh, Charles Doro. His father, Charles Doro the first, or junior, whatever his name was, he was the mayor in town. Anyway, so when I went through uh, the SNCC files, <clears throat> it seems that some of the SNCC lawyers started investigating Charles Doro because he did it a lot to black women. Well, I was just gonna... He was a doctor. Oh, black and black, yeah. so, um, but they couldn't get those black women to testify. They were too afraid. So they had to drop the case. And actually, it wasn't really illegal until 1973. They used to do it to white women. Yeah, they did it. Yeah, in the mental institutions because yep. they yep. felt that yeah. in Appalachia, poor women, poor women, yeah. the prostitutes, um, yeah. Yeah. young girls in California was big in, in your mental um, yeah mental yeah. facilities. Boston yeah. State yeah. Hospital. And it, finally, in 1973, they stopped yeah. doing that. It's shocking. It is it's shocking. <laughs> but Charles Doro, what a jerk he was. His father and the doctor. Yeah. And, that, and, so, and the other thing I wanted to mention about that, so um, I said that Hamer was anti-abortion, but before she was sterilized, she helped women access abortion services in Mount Bayou because Reverend Dr. T.M. Howard did provide abortions in Mount Bayou, so she made arrangements for women to do that. But after she was sterilized and that was taken from her, that was it. She well, was... <clears throat> look at Mississippi now. You can't have an abortion. I know. Yeah. We're one of the poorest states in the country. Yeah. Alabama Child too. abuse. Still at the bottom of yeah. the... the Alabama, yeah. Alabama too. All yeah. on the access side. to health care, access to education, housing. It's like the 48th in the nation. Yeah, still. it it's, is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We read this book in a, a nonfiction group that was about, I don't know what her name was, but she was about a black lady that got uterine cancer and they used her... Oh, cells. Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. 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 Lacks. That, yeah. They yeah. used all her... And they did blood work and stuff and never told her. Right. So, yeah. We had a book in the book club. Uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, his secretary, she passed for white. Yeah, personal librarian. Oh, per that, yes, that, that was, was a good that. story. Yeah. And I imagine every day you've got to worry that somebody's going to find out about it. And that this. they lived in a world like that. You yeah, know, it's this just was 1905. Yeah, it's just, it's insanity. It, it, it is. We 400. Souls? Yes, yes. Right. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you. Thank you. talking about family.